All right, so today we're talking all about lenses from Airy, the signature primes and probably one of the most exciting lenses that I've ever had the privilege to touch. And hopefully I don't drop, I'm actually gonna put this down right now before anything bad happens. So one of the things I wanna talk about is the differences between really nice lenses, such as this one, and one that you can find on Amazon for $50. And to talk about that, we have Art from Airy. I feel like we need a grand entrance. Cause you're airy. Okay. It's like kind of the big, that's kind of a big deal. You want to do the best entrance? It's, it's, it's coming through the backdrop. You want to, you want to. I'll come through the back. I've never come through the backdrop. Basically you rip through and you go, I'm here motherfuckers. Or you could, you could, you know, you don't have to say no, that. Tony, my boss might get. <laughs> okay. So today to help us talk about the airy signature primes, we have a lens specialist from airy, Art Adams. Woo! Yeah, there we go. I've done that before. That was cool. That was fantastic. I feel like you've done it many times before. <laughs> I'm sure most of you already know of Aerie. I talk about them a little too much, maybe. First of all, congratulations on some of the Oscar nominees. Aerie Alexis were used to shoot 1917, which blew my mind. Actually, this lens, huh? Yeah, yeah. And even this focal length, the Signature Primes 40 millimeter T 1.8. And the 35, yeah. And the 35. So between those two, shot the whole film, huh? Yeah, I believe so. And then there was Ford versus Ferrari, which used the Alexa LFs, right? It's a large format. And then the Joker used LF as well as the 65. But we can't mention the Oscars without mentioning Parasite, which was also shot on the Aerie Alexa. So I think it's safe to say Aerie knows a thing or two about cameras and lenses. When you're comparing a inexpensive photo lens that you can find on Amazon for 50 bucks, you compare it to something like this, I wanna say the first obvious difference between a cinema lens and a, a basic photo lens is one, you have gears. So we like having that so that we can plug in follow focus units to it and have our first AC pull focus and all that. So it's nice the way it's designed and all the different lenses all have the same rotation amount, right? And also they're all set at the same distance. So when you're swapping out lenses, then it's a very smooth transaction. How fast you work really determines how fast everyone else can work. And, and lens changes are typically one of the things you have to do the fastest because until there's a frame up, nobody really knows what you're looking at and nobody really knows what has to be done. When I was a, a second camera assistant, I was taught always put the lenses right behind the camera so that as soon as the DP says, I wanna see the 28, well, you turn around, bam, 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 and you do it. And if the lens is the same size, you don't have to change much. So the gears can all stay, stay in the same spot. You don't have to futz around and move with stuff open up the matte box, pull the lens off, put another lens on, close the matte box. Right. Go. So there's the obvious physical differences between a cinema lens and a photography lens, mm -hmm. but there's many different levels to lens qualities, right? Someone once told me, and it's a really interesting perspective that all lens design is compromise. Yeah. because it's all bending physics and bending physics costs money and you're always giving up something to get something else. And with really inexpensive lenses, you're trying to get a decent image at a reasonable cost. And there are some lower cost lenses that are actually really good in specific areas, but they're already always compromising somewhere. So you could get a really, really sharp lens. Maybe it has more chromatic aberration or your fixed chromatic aberration and it gets a little soft. Um, there's always a balancing act. So, right. and, and you get a better balance when you pay more money because it just costs more. You need to use better glass. The manufacturing process is more complex. Uh, there's different ways of polishing glass now where they use these molecular fluids and magnets and really strange stuff. And in this lens, there are glass elements that are more valuable by weight than gold. So I get to hold on to this, right? If you're doing it, right? That's, you guys are leaving this here? We'll work some. <laughs> we'll, we'll work some. When I first picked one up, I was surprised at how lightweight it was. It's actually not terribly heavy because this is magnesium. Yeah, it's all magnesium. And the trick with magnesium is uh, a lot of times if you machine it, it, uh, it can catch fire due to friction and then you can't put it out. So oh. Had, so, <laughs> so we had to figure out a way to do that. And we did. Also, we wanted all the lenses to be the same size. So even if some focal lengths could have been smaller, we didn't want to do that because then that means you're, you're messing around when you're changing lenses, moving gears around, stuff like that. And we, we know film crews want speed. They have to work very quickly. So all you have to do is pop open the matte box, pull one lens off, put another one on, close the matte box, and off You're you go. Good to go, huh? Yeah. But it's really good glass, and that's what we need to get the kind of performance out of this lens that we want to get. I mean, it's, 
it's got a lot of qualities to it that I don't, I've never seen in other lenses before. Part of it is that we came out with the new mount because we wanted to be able to put uh, these lenses on any camera, so Super 35 or large format and PL. We invented PL in the 80s and it's just outdated. It was meant for film. It was just too limiting because you have to leave room for a, a spinning mechanical shutter. The more room you put between the lens and the sensor of the film, the harder it is to design really high performance lenses. So if you can get rid of that space and move the lens closer to the camera, and this is actually in the stills world, why all the stills manufacturers are going to mirrorless cameras. It's because they can shrink that distance. You know, for the same reason, we couldn't have made these lenses unless we shrank that distance and made the back of this mount a lot wider. And then the signature primes are obviously prime lenses, so they don't zoom, mm -hmm. but that was how you were able to get the best image out of each of these lenses, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, that's probably the, the first step, I think, in any lens family is you come out with the primes because the primes are the ones that can be as perfect as possible. Zooms are always going to be a little bit more of a compromise because there's a lot of moving elements, a lot of things happening at once, and they all interact. And it's a much right. more complex process to make that. And I mean, these are miniature zooms, too. So if you look at focus breathing, that's another difference between still lenses and uh, really good cinema lenses like these or, or, or uh, Master Primes. When you rack through focus really quick, they don't do this. And you see that on still lenses because still lenses don't need to fix that because you're just looking at one image at a time. Right. So you can make lenses less expensively by not correcting that. But sometimes in a cinema lens, that can be really distracting. If you're trying to throw a focus and you do, you want it to be kind of a subtle thing, just going from one face to another, right. if the image goes, right. maybe that's a little bit much. These generally don't do that. Uh, at the at the extreme wide and the extreme tight end, they do a little bit of that. But in the mid range, it's it's invisible to the eye. Interesting. So if you're just racking from a something really close in the foreground to something really in the back in, in the background, you'll just see the focus shift. You won't see an image shift at all or image size change at all. Right. But that means the lens inside is actually zooming. So as we're moving the elements that focus, that naturally changes the size of the image. So we have another set of elements in there that are compensating for that perfect. Really? Yeah. So that's how you compensate. You don't get rid of it, you compensate for it. Huh? Right, because Interesting. a simple lens is always going to change image size. It's always going to do that little zoom when you, when you change focus. The hard thing is to get rid of that. So that's what we've done. Wow, so there's a little tiny zoom in and out that happens, huh? Yeah, when yeah. You're you know, one, one lens is going this way, the other one's going that way, and they have to do it in perfect sync wow. all the way through the range. When it comes to just overall image, there's five different things that we had kind of talked about, which is a difference in image characteristics. So one is uh, bokeh, right, or bokeh. Is it bokeh? It's officially it's bokeh, bokeh, right? Bokeh. Yes. But then everyone calls it bokeh. Yeah, and I'm still not saying it right, but it's it's bokeh. It's not bokeh. I was I actually specifically asked somebody who spoke Japanese, and they they corrected me. So yeah, no, because I, I speak Japanese, so I was like, oh, really? bokeh teru is uh, like it's blurry. So bokeh is uh, yeah. yeah. So that's the way. So I've been saying it right because everyone corrects me. They go, it's bokeh, dude. Nope. <laughs> I've actually trained my brain to say bokeh <laughs> because so many people were trying to correct me. I'm like, maybe that's maybe it's a different word. But yeah, if it's based off the Japanese word bokeh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. And then of course there is chromatic aberration, which I kind of knew about, but we'll definitely need to dive into that because that's there's a lot in chromatic aberration that really affects the image, whether you know it or not. And then there's also sharpness, and then there's uh, spherical aberration. Mm -hmm. which I actually don't know much about. So you're gonna have to okay. school me a little bit there. And then finally, distortion, which is another big aspect of it, which we're, most of us are familiar with, because mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the most obvious things to recognize. Mm -hmm. Typically, you see that in super wide and super long lenses. So a wide angle lens, you'll typically see barrel distortion, the edges go like that. Yeah. And then long lenses, you see pin cushion where the edges go like that. So right. basically, it's a difference in magnification between the center and the outside edges that kind of squish or pull things. Right, we could probably honestly recognize it on this lens here, because right here, I look generally proportional, but as I go to the edge, yeah, there we oh, go. Yeah. Look at that, now well, I'm nice and wide. It depends on how wide that is. So there's a difference between distortion and perspective. So if you look at, say, uh, a 15 millimeter lens, super wide, our 15 millimeter signature prime, if you get on the edges, you'll get, all, you'll get stretched. But that's just because now the distance between this side of my face and this side of my face 
is really different compared to you know oh, where the okay. camera is. Interesting. And if I come to the center, then the sides of my face are more uh, in line with each other. They be, they're the same distance. Interesting. So it's really perspective that you're seeing. If there was a straight line here and it got over here and then you started seeing a curve, yeah. that's distortion. I see. Uh, signature primes have no more than 1% distortion. Uh, and it doesn't matter what lens you're on. So what it basically means is if you put these on a lens projector with project, you're projecting straight lines, you can kind of see it if you look for it, but in reality, you're not going to see it. Zoom lenses are really interesting because you can see those change as the the lens zooms. So I've seen zoom lenses where they'll start out, you know, like, you know, pin cushion in the middle, they'll become barrel, and then at the long end, they'll become pin cushion again, and they just keep changing all the way through. Because zoom lenses are really difficult to make. So there's a lot of, lot of compromises in there, and that's one of the things sometimes they'll let go in order to to fix something else. One of the things that I thought was interesting was for distortion correction, you were saying there's a lot of cameras that have a map, right? So it automatically corrects the distortion without you even knowing. So it's almost skewing the image a little bit, huh? Right, still cameras, as far as I know, all of them and the still camera lenses uh, talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And the lens manufacturer will make a distortion map and also a chromatic aberration map so that when the camera takes the picture, it will process the image through that map and then show you an image that doesn't have those characteristics. Does the same thing, say, if you're in photo editing software. Before you ever see the image come up on your screen, it's gone through that map. So all those imperfections are dealt with. It's a great way to make inexpensive but reasonably high quality lenses and you just never see what the issues are because in a still image, you can correct that because the processing power is there to correct one still image at a time. When you're shooting 24 frames a second, you don't really have the processing power in a camera to do that unless the camera's really big and it's sucking a lot of power. Interesting. So you could have a lens on a photo camera and be like, oh, this has no distortion, throw it on a cinema lens, and then all of a sudden there's all this skewing going around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now let's get into chromatic aberration. Mm. When light comes in through a lens, you're, you're trying to bend it to a focus point, but the different wavelengths of light, the different colors of light, bend at different rates. As they disperse, you also have to bend those back again so that they come together at a point. So if you have white light coming in through a lens, you want to make sure that the other end you don't end up with a rainbow. Here's a glass element, you uh -huh. have light coming in like this, uh -huh. and then when it comes out the other side, you've got, say, red, green, and blue coming out and bending at slightly different rates. So then you have to put another element here that tries to then bend them back. Every time you add an element that's doing something, you have to keep that in mind, that you're spreading these wavelengths of light that create color. So you're always trying to bring light back together at a point. Can you close up on my face and add an explosion to my head? Okay, cool, that should be a cool little effect. <laughs> Oftentimes, lenses will correct for this very well, or fairly well, at the point of focus. It's when stuff goes out of focus that you really see issues. and say out of focus windows and backgrounds, you see that a lot, or, or trees against the sky, you see a purple or cyan outline around the, the outside of a leaf or window frame. That's chromatic aberration. Right, yeah. After the first time I went into area to talk about it, after that I walked away and I would always look for a chromatic aberration after that, and then yeah. it just blew my mind how often I would see it. When is chromatic aberration most visible? Is it when you have a, a harsh highlight coming in? or? Yeah, I think it's a harsh highlight and usually when it's, it's going out of focus. Not always, I mean, sometimes when you're in focus and you have a big highlight behind something, it'll, it'll show up. But a lot of times I see it in out of focus stuff. And you guys have different charts to test that out on, right? Yeah, I have one that's designed to uh, break lenses mm -hmm. as far as chromatic aberration. Right. And when you put some other lenses up in front of it and you throw them even just a couple of inches out of focus, you can see it pretty quick. And it tends to change color too. So in front of the point of focus, it'll turn one color usually magenta a lot of the times, and then beyond the point of focus, it'll turn green. It's usually kind of a, an opposite effect. Right. Now, there is some in these lenses, but it's really minimal because you can't completely get rid of it. But what we've done is we've made the colors that it shifts warm and cool, 
because if I see green and magenta in light, it's like, what is this a neon light? I right. don't normally exactly. see that yeah. in a forest or something like that. Uh -huh. But warm and cool, you see all the time. So even if you do see it, you, you won't notice it. So one, it has much less chromatic aberration, but when there is, it's warm and cool, which is a lot more pleasant in most cases, exactly. especially anywhere near skin tones or anything like that. Even on glasses, right? Like I've noticed a lot of chromatic aberration come off of glasses, which is really awkward because you have nice warm warm colored face and then all of a sudden just purple like what's that doing there i mean that, that's the kind of the design philosophy is how do we how do we kind of get the lens out of the way we want it to be beautiful but we don't want it to be going hey right all about yeah. me <laughs> now let's talk about bokeh well we all know what bokeh is by now you have some out of focus lights in the back and it just glows mm -hmm. so what's the difference between the bokeh on a basic lens versus the signature prime so bokeh isn't just bokeh Bokeh. 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 <laughs> Isn't just the quality of out of focus highlights, it's the entire image. You can see it most obviously in highlights, but it affects everything. Typically two kinds of bokeh, usually you have one on the far side of the point of focus and one on the close side of focus. Typically you see the donut, which is, it looks like a ring. The hi a highlight would look like a ring with a dark center. And then you would see the other kind is what we call the Christmas ornament or the Christmas ball, where it's a hot center and then it bleeds off around the edges. Now the Christmas ball is really cool because it blends. Everything blends beautifully. So the background becomes less distracting. The donut tends to preserve textures. So if you have a bunch of highlights in a tree, the tree will have lots of little rings that are competing with each other. So mm. there's lots of texture to it. If you want a vintage lens look, the donut is, you see it in a lot of vintage lenses. Um, what a lot of cinema lenses, uh, lens manufacturers go for is perfectly even bokeh because then things tend to be a lot smoother. We've gone for ultra, ultra, ultra smooth. So hard edges go out of focus really quickly, really smoothly. And what's interesting is I've noticed even in Super 35, there's a little bit of a large format effect because the large format effect is all about separating foreground objects from backgrounds, especially on wide shots. Right. So I'm shooting a wide shot of a person and the background's a little soft or a lot soft. The person feels like they're popping off that background, which gives me a sense of depth in the scene. Yeah. And these are designed so that even in Super 35, the backgrounds go so smooth that even if they aren't farther out of focus, there's just nothing for your eye to grab onto. It's just not distracting. So you still get that sense because our eyes do go to the point of focus because there are, there are edges there. There are things that we can detect that um, we can see detail. When there's no detail back here, there's a really strong sense of depth. And that's what we went for. And that has to do with really well-corrected spherical aberrations. If you're trying to take a point of light out here, and you're trying to make a point over here on a, a sensor or piece of film, you have to focus all the rays from here and get them to a perfect point here. And that's really hard to do because sometimes some of the rays will focus in front of that point, some will focus behind. And what happens is you get this kind of glow effect. So it's almost like you have a sharp image and a soft image overlaid on top of each other. I've seen it before, but I wasn't ever able to kind of put my finger on it, having a point in focus and mm -hmm. super sharp, mm -hmm. but then almost having like a, a layer of haze in front of it, sort of. And that point, maybe 50% of the rays are focusing and then the other 50% are focused a little bit in front or behind. So they're actually out of focus. Yeah, so some lenses, if you're wide open, you can't get it, oh, anything yeah. in perfect focus. And huh? that's a great example. If you're, if you're wide open and you're looking at it and like you can see some detail but it has this little kind of what I call this ghostly glow yeah that's what that is that's exactly the best way to describe it so yeah a lot of lenses I never really go wide open just because I start seeing weird things like that or flares but this one I guess shooting at t 1.8 no problem though. it's not a problem we actually have one DP who loves to shoot these wide open and then close down a couple stops on his close-up so he keeps more of a face and focus on, mm -hmm. on, on large format. There aren't a lot of lenses where you can do that and get the same look because between wide open and closing down a couple stops, most lenses change dramatically. Wide open, they'll have that extra little glow, they'll feel a little, little soft, and then you close down a couple stops and they clean up and suddenly it's like, oh, it's a very you know sharp, well-resolved image. Right. And you'll see that difference. Yeah, interesting. So there's some DPs who will choose one stop on a lens or a family of lenses and use that through an entire show because they want to keep the look that consistent. Right. If you have a perfectly spherical lens, it's really hard to make the, the outside of that lens focus at the same point as the inside which is where you uh, come up with the idea of aspherical lenses. You've probably heard of these. Uh -huh. Those are lenses that aren't perfect spheres. They have a shape to them, and that shape is designed to make sure that 
light from the outside focuses at the same point as the inside. Because otherwise, on the inside, it may focus here. The outside may focus back here. Right. Or it might focus oh, up here. Okay. But if the lens is a funky shape that's designed to compensate for that, then you can bring in all that light into focus at one point. Wide-angle lenses especially have multiple spherical lenses. They're really crazy complex uh -huh. just to, to try to focus all the light, eliminate spherical aberration, eliminate distortion, and give you, like a, in, a, in a 12 millimeter lens, a perfectly non-distorted image that's just really spectacular. Wow, and It feels like okay. you can just kind of go through the screen. So what is telecentricity? Or did I even say that right? Telecentricity. Telecentricity. <laughs> <laughs> so these lenses are near telecentric. So what, what that means is when light comes out of them, the rays are coming out as close to uh, perpendicular to the sensor, so as close to dead on as possible, even at the edges. So a lot of lenses, especially if you're using a PL mount lens uh, on a large format sensor, the light at the edges has to strain like that. And that's where you see a lot of chromatic aberration and spherical aberration and funky stuff going on at the edges of the frame. We wanted to try to get rid of that. Now to do that, we had to make the back of the lens as big as the sensor is, which is one of the reasons why we made the LPL mount. Because a lot of PL mount lenses are going to be, you know, they're going to be that big, but the sensor is that big, so you only have to strain at the edges. Right. But if I can show you telecentricity, look at where the aperture appears to be. It appears to be far away. Yeah, it, it yeah. looks like it's somewhere up here. Yeah. But in reality, it's probably somewhere here. Uh huh. Now what that does is, the farther forward that aperture appears to be, the farther the light thinks it's traveling, so the angle ends up being less extreme at the edges. Now, if you look in the back of this lens and you see the aperture looks like it's going to be right here, then the light's going like that. Right. But the fact that we look in there and we see it, it's way down in here, the light's actually coming out like that. Interesting. So that's ideal because then you can go straight into the sensor. There's no photons essentially going in at an angle, right? A photosite has depth. Right. So if light hits it too steep, you you lose some exposure. And right. you see that with old lenses. If you put an old lens on a digital camera, a lot of times you'll see some vignetting around the outside. And right. that can be cool, but that's what is going on. Why do some lenses have vignetting? Uh, these actually have some vignetting wide open because in order to get rid of that, we'd have to make the lens really big. And wow. actually a lot of lenses when they're wide open will do that because uh, light coming in at the edges, uh -huh. gets, it gets a little bit of a haircut mm -hmm. at a wide open aperture. And you can actually see uh, cat's eye bokeh, for example. You've probably seen how uh, highlights take on a cat's eye around the edges of a frame when lenses are wide open, mm -hmm. so they're not circles anymore. Well, if you just look in the back of the lens and you just turn, you know, rotate a little bit, you can see where that cat's eye is. You're just looking through the lens at an angle. And that's oh, what the sensor okay. sees. I see. So we can't really eliminate that without making the lens massive. So between wide open and about 2.8, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll see a little bit of a cat's eye effect. So then the other thing that happens is in front of a sensor, you've got uh, some filters. You've got an IR cut filter, an optical low pass filter, and then a protective cover glass. And those are optical elements. So if the light comes through and hits the center of a sensor, it's going through a certain amount of light on that cover glass. Yeah. But at the edges, it's going through more because it's coming through at an angle. Ah, okay. And digital lenses actually have to be designed with that in mind. Film lenses, like old film lenses, don't take that into account. So they actually look funkier on digital cameras than they ever did in film. One of the other reasons this is telecentric is because light goes through that cover glass or that filter package as close to the same angle as possible all the way across. So we eliminate all those weird effects. Do you put a coat over the glass, right? Yeah, very, very, very fine layers. And uh, a big part of that is trying to prevent uh, reflections from happening. So light comes through an element and hits the next element back. You don't want light from that next element back to come and reflect on the element in front of it. And when you have a bunch of elements together, that can build up very quickly. You can lose a lot of light coming through a lens. Your T-stop actually can go up massively. So this you know, with bad coatings, this could be a T2A lens pretty easily, and it would just look very milky. Oh, wow. You lose okay. a lot of stuff. So the coatings actually make it so that the light passes through with as little of that going on as possible. And that helps you really uh, see deep in the shadows, see a lot of detail. It keeps the, the blacks and the darker tones really rich and deep, because otherwise everything just kind of light scatters around and everything comes up and becomes kind of milky. And highlights can get a little bit of a funky glow, I mean, you really want the light to just kind of come through as unadulterated as possible. 
So, and every time there's a, a lens surface, you take a risk of having a reflection interfere with that. So that's what coatings do is try to wipe as much of that out as possible. So that also plays into a little bit of contrast? Oh, say? in a big way, yeah. Uh -huh. Because contrast, if you, if you don't have good coatings, then you have so much internal reflection going on that all the darker tones just become washed out. Right. The colors become washed out and the lens becomes very low contrast. And sometimes that's that's good. You know, in the old days, if you were shooting a really contrasty film stock or shooting in a really contrasty environment, you'd use a low contrast filter or a low contrast lens, and then they all balance out. But you know, these days we have an awful lot of control and post. You really want to capture the most dynamic range you can because then you can do whatever you want with it later. So we've tried to design these so that the mid-tones are very open, you see a lot of detail, but then you still have nice crisp blacks at the bottom of that. Because once you lose blacks, especially in HDR, the image just feels kind of murky. How's uh, flares affected by coating? Coatings play a big part in, in eliminating flares. Now in these lenses, we tried not to eliminate flares completely because flares can be really interesting. So we actually tried to preserve it, but what we do is we try to, to isolate it. So if there's a flare in this part of the frame, try to make it so that it doesn't light up this part of the frame. Beautiful backlit scene, sun poking through some trees. We don't want the entire thing to come up in, in uh, contrast and kind of milk out. The area around the sun can, and that's okay, but over here, we don't want it to be affected. Some lenses, if you put a big highlight over here, like the sun, this side of the lens will just go milky. Like everything just gets washed out as soon as any sort of sun hits the lens. And then there's also uh, the inside of the lens. So uh, sometimes you'll see when you're panning across a light source, like the sun is a good one, you'll see these big rings. That's a shiny surface around the inside of the lens catching light and then kicking off the glass on the inside. So you have to make sure the inside of the, inside of the lens is as uh, non-reflective as possible to eliminate all that stuff. I mean, in some of the older lenses, that's part of the look, is you get these funky rings and striations and weird stuff going on, and right. it can be really cool. But that's also really easy to do. So we've gone the other direction and tried to make a lens that doesn't do that. And it costs more money to do it, but there's not as many options out there if you want to do that. So that's kind of why we went that direction. Interesting. Now, speaking of flares, I think it's really cool that these Signature Primes have these rear nets and diopters that you can magnetically attach to the back of it. And it really changes the lens. Seems like it gives it some really interesting textures and flares. And depending on what you attach back there, it seems like it really gives it a whole nother feel. It's like having a whole different lens. I feel like it's not that hard to get a sharp lens, even in inexpensive lenses now. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between the sharpness you get out of a photo glass and something like this? Part of it is how sharp is it? Because in, in the photo world, sometimes people like really, really sharp because then if you make a print, there's so much detail. There's a, a three-dimensional, they call it 3D pop. It almost feels like the image is com you know, coming off the page. But in moving images uh, on a big screen, that can be a bit much. And then there's a lot of people who really like soft lenses because they're very flattering. It's hard to go wrong, even if the makeup's not right on an actor or, or actress's face. So what we've tried to do is kind of walk that line and try to come up with the most natural looking lens we can. And there's some secret sauce in here that even I don't totally understand. But um, we've really tried to get the resolution as high as possible, but without that extra edge sharpening effect that feels artificial. Oh yeah, no, I hate that look of just over sharpening. Mm. One of the things I find interesting is that this is an incredibly sharp lens, but it also has a timeless look. Isn't that kind of the approach that you guys took? Well, and, and what's funny about that is, is it, that means something different to everyone who show it to you, because you know, people will say, oh, this lens has uh, such a, a classic lens look. Well, what does that mean? Well, skin feels soft. Yes, but then if you really punch in on it and look at it, it's like, oh, I can, you can see everything, all the details there. It's just not artificially sharp. Right, it's almost like really just sharpening the things that we would recognize in person. It just feels very natural, huh? Yeah, it's, it's like if I'm looking at you right now, I'm not examining your skin, you know, it doesn't look over sharp to me, it just looks real. Right. And that's what we tried to do here. Yeah, but on, yeah, exactly. On camera, when it's over sharp and the first things you see is like, oh my God, those pores. And that's when you know, it's like, oh, that's way too sharp. Huh? Right. What was interesting to me is that I'm kind of used to hearing, you know, timepieces being shot on film with vintage lenses. Here we are now with 1917, mind blowing uh, piece on World War One, shot on some of the latest and greatest technology, Alexa Vidi LF with signature primes. Huh? Yeah, I think it's a matter of whether you're trying to 
play off people's nostalgia because you know if, if someone's trying to shoot a film that takes place in the 1970s, well maybe you want to make it look like a film that takes place in the 1970s by using the same technology. That's a valid approach. Or you might try to just create the, the most realistic um, images of settings that look like the 1970s. Right. I mean, both, both are valid approaches. It just depends on whether you want to play off that nostalgia or you want to play off the realism. Right, yeah. I totally felt like I was there mm -hmm. when watching 1917. Those have been shot with lenses from that era. It would have been a very different look. It would have been more abstract. It would have been softer. There would have been more aberrations. And it, you would have felt more separate from it. Right. Whereas these lenses just kind of drop you right in it. Yeah. And most importantly, all the markers glow. Yes, so that's the, that's where uh, most of the uh, R&D went. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, just those little details. It's like when you buy a really nice car, you yeah. know, and the emblem lights up on the dashboard. And like, oh, someone thought of that, you know. The, the focus marks lighting up, that's, that's one of those extra little things. I mean, it's also just to, to make someone's life easier, which is the other thing, is we kind of understand how these things get used on a set. You know, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of pressure. You you have to get things right the first time. We just try to make it as easy as possible to help the camera crews move quickly and get the images they want. Now, when it comes to handling lenses of this caliber, there's a there's a, there's a couple rules, right? Like you want to always leave it wide open when you're transporting it. That's... Yeah, what I was taught was wide open and and set to infinity because then uh, set to infinity, I'm told all the elements kind of compress into a kind of a narrow range and then wide open you get all the aperture leaves compressed at the edge so that the case gets banged, you know, things aren't moving around as much. Uh -huh. And I got into a habit. So basically, here's how you hand off a lens. So uh, if I'm handing this to you, I would hold it like this and I would just, hand it to you. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I have a story about that. Um, so you put your hand out like that. Okay. And then there you go. And then you say, got it, or I have it, or thank you, or something. Thank you very much All right. for this. Got I'm going to keep this now. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now you hand it to me the same way. So well then. exactly. Thank you. Got it. And then what I would do typically as a second camera assistant when I'm putting this away, so say the, the you know, it's all like set, messed mm -hmm. up like that, I, I would grab the bottom of it and I just go bam, bam, put the caps on, put it in the case. Got it. Now, you never keep the caps on when you take it out of the case. The caps stay in the case because, for example, if I'm handing it to someone and I'm holding it by the cap or you're trying to put it on the camera with the cap on and the ca cap comes off, the lens goes. So when they go to the camera, there's there's no caps on it. But okay. the other thing is the lens case should be right behind the camera because lens changes have to happen really fast. So right. when I was a, a second camera assistant, I, it was beaten into me. The lens case just follows the camera wherever. And then when it comes to cleaning a lens like this, so this is what I was taught. You could tell me if I'm correct. So basically you just take this, crumple it up, and then spray once or twice. And then you start rubbing down the lens in circles from the center and then work your way out. But this is after you blow it with a little... Squishy thing. That's a little squishy thing. <laughs> That's first. Well, so if you ask my product manager, he would say use this. Airy microfiber. Exactly. Uh, he actually had these specially made. But yes, you never want to put liquid on the lens because then it can run around, it can pool, it can get inside the lens, and then bad things happen because it's easy to get it inside the lens. It's really hard to get it outside of the lens. So yeah, you typically want to crumple up something like that, put just a little drop on the edge, make it a little moist, mm -hmm. and then you go around and, you know, just very delicately clean the lens. You don't want to scratch the coating, so you don't want to apply any pressure. Yeah, I mean, hopefully you just learn not to do things like, you know, put your hand on the back of the lens or right. you know, things things like that. I mean, I, you know, you still do it once in a while, but, you know, you just... Right. Now, shall we go answer some questions on Instagram? Surely. On a scale from one to sexy, how sexy are these lenses? Um, they're... Se what's beyond sexy? What is the difference between F-stops and T-stops? Oh, that's a good one. Okay. So an f-stop, it's a mathematical equation. You can't get it wrong. The t-stop is different. The t-stop actually accounts for how much light you lose when light is going through the lens. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to that whole coding thing. So if you have like an f2 uh, lens, but the coatings don't work very well or it's uncoded and you get a lot of light bouncing around, it may actually be a t28 lens because you're not actually getting that much light through. You're losing light on the way through. A T-stop is actually 
a better measure because it's measuring the light that actually gets to the other side. Right, yeah. This is a T18 lens. It's probably an F1.6 or one point, you know, something like that uh -huh. because that mathematical f-stop measurement doesn't account for the fact that there probably is a little bit of light getting lost in here. And the T-stop is going to tell you exactly how much is coming through. For exposure, T-stop is dead on. Right. F-stop is, you know. So F-stop, you can still be a variation on your exposure, but T-stop always dead on. Right. Well, uh, mostly. T-stops are measured through the center of the lens. And also, they're also measured at infinity. There's a lot of lenses where if you focus closer, you will lose exposure. Yeah, that is actually something I didn't know till recently. Yeah, it's but uh, signature primes, and that's I didn't know that either. And then I looked at signature primes, and they didn't do that. So that's why I started noticing, like, why are my close-ups all brighter on this lens than on other lenses? And it turns out they just don't change exposure. Yeah, who would have known that just by racking focus, you can slightly change that exposure? Huh? Yeah, there's so much stuff to know. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Does Aerie make anamorphic cine lenses? Yes. Yeah. Uh, master prime. Aerie anamorphic. master anamorphics, yes. Uh-huh. They are very good. Yeah. We, we need to do a video about anamorphics one day, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, that'll be a long video. <laughs> yeah. What is a disadvantage to cinema lenses? Opposed to photo lenses. No autofocus. Ah, uh, no autofocus. <laughs> Your autofocus is a human. That's true. Well, <laughs> autofocus doesn't know where to focus for the story. Yeah, exactly. You know, person can follow the story. So, and autofocus, yeah, you know, for a lot of stuff, so autofocus is really good, but uh, for cinema stuff, yeah, there's, too, there's too much artistry to that. Right, yeah, totally. Because sometimes autofocus gets good for convenient stuff like this, yeah. but then it's yeah, just it's, the box is just hopping between our faces. It has no <laughs> idea who to focus on. What's the bokeh like? It's perfect. Yeah, it, uh, it's really, 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 really smooth. Yeah. Uh, the smoothest of any lens I've seen, which is one of the things I like. Uh, so what I describe it as like, is if like, if there's a window behind us and you're shooting us with a signature prime, it's almost like there's water running down the window. It's like a like a sheet of water because there's there's no uh, structure, there's no detail. It's just you can see shapes and they're very soft. Interesting. Yeah, it's a really nice look. Yeah, it is. You could definitely feel it. It's hard to put into words. It is. And it's very hard to put into a spec sheet, isn't it? It's impossible. <laughs> you can't just like on the spec sheet. You guys just need to put. It's really good. It Trust is. us. <laughs> You'll feel good things when you look at footage from it. It's a German company, so we're very precise. So yes. unless you can describe it precisely, it's not going to end up on the spec sheet. <laughs> All right. Well, awesome. Thanks for coming in and giving me. us the whole rundown of cinema lenses. What video should we do next with Harry? I don't know. We should, oh. we should take a poll. We should, should we throw up a poll yeah. and just see what people want to hear yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. One thing I want to definitely talk about in a future video is the Airy Trinity, which is the stabilization system that they used for 1917. I keep bringing up that movie. I just watched it. It's fresh in my head. I'm really excited about it. But you look at the movement through that film and it's just mind blowing. And yeah, the Airy Trinity is the way they were able to accomplish a lot of those shots. So that's awesome. And with this lens right here, I guess most of the shots were shot on this 40 millimeter, except for apparently one? one shot on a 35, but the rest of it was shot on this very focal length. Wow. So all you need is this one lens. See, I was going to say, yeah, it gets really expensive once you start adding up the, the other lenses to get the whole set. But really, you only need one. Yeah, only need one. Maybe borrow the 35 mil for one day and yeah. you, you could shoot an Oscar nominated film. Yeah. World War One <laughs> films are pretty cheap. Yeah. Just get the one lens and you're good. Yeah. And then just spend the rest of the budget on uh, costume and explosions. Thank you